Morning, fellow zombies. Are we alive yet? Are we awake yet? 4.03 in the morning West Coast time. It is the 20th of April, 2024, for a Saturday. The Weaver Agency of Roseman, California. Uh, a zombie I hear deaths for sure because I'm feeling it. <laughs> All right. Uh, shout out to Artist in Recovery slash Daryl P. You're talking about Taylor Swift who came across that story, I think, uh, yesterday or day before yesterday. When checking out a few things. I was also checking out a few other things that were popping in my head that I wasn't quite sure if I really wanted to do some research on this one or not. That scares me when I get into politics, but you were talking about recovery. Your shtick. I was trying to go over my own personal history as well regarding it. I hardly ever talk about my recovery. Sometimes it's personal. Sometimes people like to share their own stories. And sometimes I'm a little... I'm a little hesitant, a little guarded. I try not to bother in people's recovery. I try not to talk about what they're going through. Bad enough the stuff I'm going through as it is. I tried to make it no, you know, no false points every time I kept going to a meeting hall and go to a lecture or sitting in my seat and telling my story. But it's never easy. Some alcoholics will just say, oh yeah, I've done this and I drank this and I drank that and ha ha ha. The problem is I don't remember the drinking aspects of it, but I do remember the behavioral aspects of it. It's like a scientist going through a chemical change into a creature. Now, like Dr. David Banner getting exposed to gamma radiation, and he's got the Hulk, and he barely Hulk barely remembers what David Banner remembers. But David Banner remembers what the Hulk did, because he's right along with him. But when it came for the case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, Two different personalities, two, two different mindsets sitting in the same brain. Our subconscious versus our consciousness. Sometimes we can remember what we've done and other times we can't. Mine. I remember being an argumentative mean bastard at times. At times. The rest of the times I thought I was alright, but... I didn't realize I was creating a ticking time bomb inside of myself growing up as a kid. I didn't realize I was going to be turning into some kind of mean ass serapus. But the problem is, I'm asking myself are the stories legitimate or are they really exaggerated a bit? Because I know. As a storyteller, I can tell a whopper story, but the problem is I have to be truthful and honest with myself. In our program of uh, recovery, we have to be honest with ourselves. We have to do a moral inventory of ourselves on a constant basis to see whether or not we're actually legitimate or not. And if we're not, then I guess we have an issue. But it's not with others, it's with ourselves. Whether or not we're, we're honest with, it, with each other. And we're honest with ourselves and also honest with our higher power who knows us better than we knew, than we know of ourselves. And a lot of people pick God or Jesus or something else for that one. I've always been unsettled concerning about the spirituality because having touched that particular power at the age of four years old, open heart surgery, <coughs> it was uh, situations happening died three times, come back to life three times, but you know, been up and down, up and down, up and down. It does something to a kid. It does something to a person who doesn't quite grasp it. No matter how many times I keep getting uh, literature about the thing, it doesn't matter. It's about how I feel about the powers than my own. And I always find blame is something or find anger. Maybe somewhere in there there was a stirring pot of anger starting up. A 
starts the whole thing up. A 12 step recovery hall. Starting a journey is doing the fourth step. It's not exactly the first step for me. I admitted I was powerless over alcohol or fill in the blank on that one. That my life is totally unmanageable. Two, came to believe that the power greater myself can restore to me sanity. Three, made a decision to turn my life into the care of a higher power. Well, I'm paraphrasing everything on that one. The question is, am I truly an alcoholic or not? People I've come across can try to remember their first drunk and, oh yeah, that was great, I was drinking, I was having a party, and I was doing this, and I was... Or maybe they drank for the first time and became oblivious to what the hell was going on, or something else. The thing is, in my brother's recovery, or not in my brother's recovery, but in my life, I had seen alcoholics and I never even recognized them, but I recognized the stench. I recognized an enabler and a drunk. Every time I kept seeing an ant, I had hardly ever seen her sober, drunk most of the time. I wasn't quite sure if I loved the drunk or if I loved the woman. And that scared the hell out of me too. Coming up with new revelations of how I've seen people and my own self for that matter. I realized I was going to be my, my nature but I could not stand this stuff. I couldn't stand that aspect. I couldn't see this person. I was a lush. Trying to, trying to be a big sister to my mother. I still cared about her. I still loved her. And I didn't blame her for it because I didn't understand what the hell was going on. Nor do I understand it concerning about the chemicals that would invade a body through smoke. I'm not talking about cigarettes either. Some people actually consider this hemp or this weed, this marijuana, whatever the hell they call this shit. It was supposed to be like a mood stabilizer or something like that. It helps alleviate the stress after you. Problem is, it sets up the craving you needed. You wanted more and more of the damn stuff. I didn't understand that as a kid. But I understand how it was affecting people left and right, turning people mean after that. When you have weed and alcohol at the same time, you're unstable. And I'd seen that in my brother. It scared the hell out of me. I didn't want to be anything like him. One time, he was in the garage. I was living on a street called McKeever. I was going to I was going to high school during that time. And he was smoking out in the garage. And he offered me a lid. I said no thanks. I guess in that point, maybe it set himself up that I was going to be the normie in the family. I didn't realize I wasn't going to be a normie. My life wasn't normal. I thought other people had normal families. What was normal? We didn't have it. We didn't have it at all. Mother stressed out, she became an overeater, tagged up on candy and junk food. Trying to deal with a mother that was dying in front of her and she couldn't deal with it. Hidden food. My brother struggling with the Navy and everything else hitting on him as a big brother or as the firstborn. And The stuff he went through in the Navy. When he came home for that year, he was a changed person. 
I didn't recognize him. I didn't recognize him. He scared the hell out of me. He's trying to be a big brother. But somehow I knew he wasn't. I didn't want to be anything like him. Man, I drinks. He's, my brother smoked. My brother smoked a lot of cigarettes, but I was kind of used to that because Ma smoked cigarettes a lot. I was a secondhand smoker. And then I wake up one day and I get asthma. <laughs> I blamed it on the San Fernando Valley and all this nice lovely air out there, but me, it wasn't that. Lifestyle. I was surrounded by. Things happened, right? And the program of uh, recovery doesn't matter if you label it narcotics or alcoholic, you still have to, or anything else, you have to be true to yourself you have to be truthful you have to be honest you even have to be honest with your higher power if you're truthful to yourself you can be truthful to your higher power about it but then everybody else different story all together isn't it and to say anything else besides the truth is breaking your integrity and it breaking some portion of you that wants the integrity because it Integrity is everything. Well, what happens if there are some portions of your life you just can't reveal to anybody because you just can't reveal it to yourself because you don't know? See, this is a problem with me concerning about me in the, in the rooms of recovery because... I hear the stories from everybody else who had been drinking. They've been drinking. And they'll talk about their drunk. They'll talk about the last drink. They'll talk about how wonderful it was or they'll turn into a mean bastard at that point. But they'll talk about their first experience and like, oh, wow, was euphoria. I've tasted about euphoria before. I had euphoria, and I was turned away from it, and I had a lifelong anger and resentment towards it. I did. It scared me. People chase that in the meeting halls, but also in church. They wanted to be closer to God. They wanted to feel the power. They wanted to feel the euphoria. I wasn't quite sure if I actually wanted it or not. I had it. They're looking for the ultimate high. I already had it, and and it wasn't my time to go up into it. I knew that euphoria. I knew that feeling. I knew that that power, that sensation of, Everything lifted off you, you free, you, you're liberated. And you get back to your mortal corpse and then everything else is a weight, a drag. It's no wonder I had a hell of a lot of resentment against God. I didn't understand it then. I'm still trying to understand it now. I didn't need the chemical euphoria. I had it. A few times in my in my youth, I had it. But I guess everything else got in its way. I knew what being part of the spirit was. People talk about being born again. Well, they wouldn't know about born again unless they wrote unless they died and came back to life, literally. But for me, it was at the age of four years old. I wouldn't know what it was like to be an adult doing that thing. But that scared the hell out of me. Probably scared the hell out of my brother, too. He'd been through it. 
But he was still a changed man afterwards, that's for darn sure. And he still couldn't quite talk about it as much. He talks about the white light. He talked about the tunnel and hearing Ma's voice. Saying, Dave, it wasn't your time. You know, Dave, it's not your time. Go back. You're all right, Dave. Something like that. Anyway, he comes back to life. Uh, he had a heart attack and he was just about to leave. And then Ma's like, you're all right, Dave. A voice telling him that it wasn't his time. I understand why people chase it because it's elusive. It's fleeting. A sampler of what's beyond it, people keep, keep chasing. They want that feeling. They want that, that thinking. They want that experience. Scared the hell out of me. People will chase it with the chemicals and alcohol. I was hiding from everything. I was hiding from life. I was hiding from myself, from pain, from fear, from everything. I mean, I, I was just layered on with a lot of negative crap that I didn't realize what the hell was going on. And if I was drinking, it means I wanted to chase that damn feeling. Me, I, I didn't think God wanted me. I really didn't think God wanted me. I mean, he was saving me down here for a purpose, for a mission, for something. Maybe just to live. I was afraid, I was afraid every time people were drinking and, and using his... I didn't know it then. I couldn't grasp it then. I couldn't. I didn't have perspective. I had the experience, but I didn't know how to put it into perspective. I'd see my brother chase the damn thing with alcohol and, and drugs. I mean, basically it was the marijuana maintenance and it was also the alcohol. And I'd seen it would have turned into a mean bastard after that, that point. That scared the hell out of me. I was turning into a mean bastard. I didn't even realize it half the time. Isolated, aloof. I wasn't trying to drink or drug up or anything. Even though I wanted to go back. I wanted that feeling again. If I had started drinking, I don't remember when. When it was the first drink or the first hit. But all I remember is I know that feeling. Ease of mind, peace, tranquility. Euphoria, that nothing else matters anymore, that you're in a total state of total bliss that is undescribable. People chase that. They still keep chasing it. I can remember fleeting moments and fleeting feelings of it. Of the experiences of the times I've been through. But when it comes down from being actually drunk and stupid and, and, and drugged out of a mind, there's no drug in the world, there's no alcohol in the world that will actually get up to that point. They'll screw around with the brain left and right, but you don't just experience it having chemicals flying through your body and you feel that way. No. It's the soul itself. It's the soul itself that feels it. It's at a higher, more concentrated level than anybody else can, can imagine. Because the body cannot deal with that level. At least mine couldn't. Mine couldn't. I don't remember when I had my first drink, if I actually had one. All I know is I couldn't stand the stuff that was around me. And that time that I went to a meeting, after admitting I am powerless over people, places, things, and events, I'd seen these two guys in a meeting hall that my brother kept going to when we got out here to Antelope Valley. And these two gentlemen were trying to understand what the hell I was going through. I didn't understand what the hell I was going through. They probably interpreted 
that I drank and, and blacked out and didn't even remember what the hell it was. Probably. But to say that was an alcoholic in training. But to say identify yourself as an alcoholic. You can sit and participate with it. You can tell your story, but... So I did. I tried to be connected to this concept of the, of the power greater than myself to restore me to sanity. I could this higher power. Call them many things. And it still scares me. But I guess not so much these days. If I can think about it, if I can just feel about it, I get an instinct about it. Maybe I don't have to be worried about it. If I was going to think about it in the form of Star Wars mythology as the Force, then maybe I was hooked up to the Force one way or another. And slowly but surely I'm trying to feel my way through it. I already know what loss and depth of pain can do to a person. It's changed me too many damn ways. Maybe it's liberated me. I don't know. By losing people, losing family, friends, pets. Well, to me, pets are still family anyway. Changes a person. And yesterday, maybe I was going through a catharsis. I don't know. But all I know is I was afraid of losing my mama, and I didn't. A simple ear infection she had. Go to the vet, get it, some kind of medications for it. It'll take some time. I clear up the infection. Come back in a couple of weeks. No problem. She comes home. She's groggier than anything. I figure the old age is getting to the lady. And I was feeling at peace. But relieved more. That she was all right for right now, and I could stay in that moment that she's all right, and then become worried and paranoid that she may not be the next day. So I still have to keep an eye on her. But in connecting up with that energy, that's the thing. Sometimes I still want that energy. Sometimes I want to be hooked up to that energy so damn bad. Especially when I feel the pain and loss of family and of losing people left and right of my family. Of losing her. I kept thinking it would be the worst day of my life. But I've had a lot of days that felt like the worst days of my life. Her, on the other hand... I was feeling sick to my stomach on this one. But I should have been feeling more at peace, at, at ease and peace, maybe. I guess she would be all right. Maybe in some instinctual level, I had that. I didn't need to chase chemicals. I had felt what chemicals can do to a brain. I've seen how alcohol has screwed up families personally I've seen how drugs can ruin a person's life up close personal but the thing is developing the resentment towards it or towards them because they had to go through this stuff coping mechanisms we go through coping mechanisms my family and I had been through just to deal and cope. Just not deal with life on life's terms. It's hard. It's hard to talk about stuff. It's hard to talk about spirituality when you're still trying to label the damn thing. They don't know about it. They don't know about that level of bliss. That level of energy. More peaceful, more content and 
sometimes once in a great while I'll probably touch it and it's not like getting electrocuted at this point over here it's like dealing with a warm fuzzy comfortable recognizable presence that you that you know of I don't need to get the chemical high. I don't need it. I don't want it. I don't want to go out there and look for the damn drink. I keep trying to think about stuff like this. Every time I keep seeing and hearing people talking about this person in their recovery or this person in their drunkenness or this person regarding their chemical abuse or this person going through this situation. Yeah, I see it in the stories. I hear it. And they're on their own individual pathway. They're on their own journey. If they can't see it, what's going on in front of them, no matter how many times people will tell them about it, they won't acknowledge it. I know. I know. I've seen my brother go through the damn shit. Scared the hell out of me for me going through the same damn shit. I'd seen how I wanted to kill myself. I mean, seriously contempted. I seriously thought of it. I'll try to kill myself. I'd seen how it changes lives. I didn't want that for me. But I didn't recognize it back then. It scared the hell out of me. Sometimes it still does.